Welcome to part two of uh, week four of American Christianity, THEO 235. Um, as you recall, we're covering the period from the end of the Civil War until World War I, from roughly 1865-1866 to about 1918. Um, in this second uh, part of the lecture, uh, we're going to cover a number of different topics. Let me uh, uh, first uh, introduce you to them, and then I'll go into them in greater detail. First of all, we're going to talk about the Americanist crisis in the Catholic Church, the crisis of Americanism. Second, we're going to talk about mainstream Protestantism in the late 19th century. We've already talked about uh, liberal theology or liberal Protestantism and the social gospel. Now we're going to be talking about mainstream Prot uh, Protestantism. Um, next thing will be the emergence or rather the reemergence of crusading Protestantism. Uh, those types of movements which were viewed by those who undertook them as crusades to reform some type of evil in society. And last, we're going to be talking about American imperialism um, and manifest destiny. American imperialism refers to the impulse uh, toward creating an empire, toward expanding one's boundaries outside of the, the natural or traditional boundaries uh, and becoming a, an empire. Okay, so with that, let's begin talking about the uh, crisis of Americanism in the Catholic Church now. Um, the major issue here was that um, participation or really was the relationship between participation in the Catholic Church and participation in the mainstream of American culture. The question was in the Americanist controversy, should one uh, as a good Catholic participate in the mainstream of American culture or should Catholics um, stay under themselves, stay within their, their own basically ethnic communities and um, not participate in mainstream Protestant American culture. The Americanists just to outline the positions for you, the Americanists were those who believed that Catholics could and should participate in uh, the broader American society. And those who were opposed to Americanism were the ones who uh, said that uh, Catholics should not take part in the broader culture. Okay, and the reason why the anti-Americanists uh, felt the way that they did is because they believed that the American way of life was fundamentally at odds with the Catholic way of life, that the two were not compatible. Okay? Um, the major proponents of, uh, the major supporters of Americanism were people like, and this list isn't inclusive, it doesn't include everybody, there are others, but the, some of the major leaders of the Americanist movement were Cardinal James Gibbons, of Baltimore, Archbishop John Ireland of St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, um, Bishop John J. Keene of Richmond, Virginia, and Monsignor, later Bishop Dennis O'Connell, the rector of Catholic University, who later, as I said, became a bishop. The strongest opponents of Americanism were, for the most part, the more traditional Irish bishops, Irish American bishops, um, and in particular the leader of the anti-Americanist movement was Archbishop uh, Michael Corrigan of New York City. Okay, what were the battlegrounds upon which the Americanist controversy played itself out? There were several, okay? Um, first of all it had to do with um, the public versus the parochial schools. When I say parochial schools, I ref I'm referring to parish schools. The Americanists believed that Catholic kids could and should um, make use of the public schools. 
while the traditionalists um, held that, uh, that there should be uh, a separate education system, a separate system of elementary and high schools for Catholic kids. You know as history has played itself out in America that um, the, the, um, the Catholic school system uh, did exist, it, did, uh, it does continue to exist, and it continues to thrive. Outside of the public school system in the United States, the Catholic school system is the second largest uh, school system in the country. Okay. Um, the second uh, battleground or second arena in which Americanism played itself out was uh, regarding the plight of the workers. The Americanists supported the right of the the rights of the workers for um, better working conditions, for a fair wage, for some kind of uh, pension and benefits, uh, and uh, and for the right to collective to organize collectively, for the right to form unions, while the traditionalists did not. And uh, finally, the other the other major battleground had to do with the ownership of property. Um, the the um, the uh, Americanists, well, I should say the anti-Americanists, um, were those who believed that the American system was uh, just fine. Um, on the other hand, Americanists like Henry George condemned private uh, ownership of property. They were socialists and they believed that socialism was uh, the right way to go. Now Hen Henry George uh, en ended up being excommunicated um, you know, from the church for his positions. The Catholic Church has leaned ever so slightly toward uh, some moderate forms of socialism over the past 130 years or so, but it's never fully embraced socialism. Do keep that in mind. The Catholic Church has never fully embraced the capitalist system, although it may look that way, and the Catholic Church never fully embraced uh, socialism. Okay. The Pope in Rome during this period of time was Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and Leo the Thirteenth's attitude toward the Americanists seems to have wavered back and forth. In the beginning, it appears as though he sided with the Americanists when he issued his encyclical letter, Rerum Novarum. What is an encyclical? Let me spell it: E N C Y C. L I C A L. An encyclical letter is a letter that uh, is circulated throughout the worldwide Catholic Church. It comes from the Pope and it is written about a particular topic uh, that should be of interest to all Catholics. Rerum novarum, let me spell that, it's Latin. First word is rerum, R E R U M. The second word is novarum, N-O-V-A-R-U-M. The, the title literally means of new things. And so Pope Leo XIII was writing about some new issues that were facing the church. In particular, he chose to uh, talk about um, the plight of the working class, both in Europe and in America. I think I've discussed this before, but the condition of the working class in Europe, both in Europe and in America was desperate, really poor. Um, the owners of, uh, of companies were able to uh, make workers work uh, ungodly long hours without breaks six or seven days a week in terrible working conditions for uh, less than decent wages. They hired children to do, uh, you know, adults' work. They hired um, women uh, to do adults' work. And so the plight of the working class during this phase of the Industrial Revolution 
was abhorrent. And Pope Leo XIII chose the encyclical Rerum Novarum to initiate what is now known as the modern Catholic social teaching. There, we'll look at other aspects of the Catholic social teaching in, in later weeks. But keep in mind that in 1891, Rerum Novarum and Pope Leo XIII inaugurate what is known as the modern Catholic social teaching. Now, in Rerum Novarum, um, Leo XIII sides with the Americanists and advocates for uh, labor reform. He advocates for a just wage, working conditions, pensions, those types of things. However, four years later, by 1895, he had uh, changed his mind. And in uh, some of his uh, published statements, he said that, that American Catholics should associate only with other Catholics. And so he switched his view. Uh, and when he did this, he removed Bishop Keene and uh, Monsignor O'Connell from their positions in the United States. Remember, Keene and O'Connell were um, Americanists. But then again, four years later, in 1899, Leo XIII shifts back a little bit again to the side of the Americanists. He issues an, encycl an encyclical entitled Testem Benevolentiae. You ready for that spelling? Testem, T-E-S-T-E-M. Benevolentiae, B-E-N-E-V-O-L-E-N-T-I-A-E. And in Testem Benevolentiae, Leo XIII, while he doesn't come out fully supporting the Americanists, he stops short of condemning the Americanists. And in Catholic writings, especially in the writings of the popes, um, what they don't say is sometimes as important or even more important than what they do say. So the fact that he did not condemn the Americanists at least shows that he, while not fully supportive, at least didn't say that they should be done away with. Okay. Now, let's place the Americanist controversy in a, a broader context. Americanism was just one expression or one manifestation of a broader movement that, um, um, that the Vatican, that Rome, called modernism. Modernism um, was viewed by uh, Rome as any attempt to adapt the Catholic Church to the intellectual, moral, and social needs of the times. That sounds pretty horrible, but the, the belief, the view behind uh, that position was that the truths of the Catholic Church are timeless that they can't change and that they shouldn't change and that um, the Catholic Church should not adapt its, its teachings to what is going on in the world rather the world should adapt itself to the teachings of the Church. Modernism touched on some of the same issues as the liberal Protestant movement. In other words, it it dealt with um, uh, creationism uh, versus evolution. Um, and it dealt with the uh, historical critical method of biblical interpretation. Uh, it, needless to say, the Vatican at this time favored neither. The, 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 uh, the Vatican and the Catholic Church, the official Catholic Church, um, viewed creationism as superior to evolution and viewed evolution as a threat and did not embrace the historical critical method of biblical interpretation. Those two things were viewed as um, ex other examples of modernist tendencies. Okay, um, As I said, the Catholic Church viewed its 
its teachings as timeless and changeless. And so while and so, and so the world should change and adapt itself to the church rather than the church changing and adapting itself to the world. Even though modernism was never really a threat to the American church, in reality it never was, still um, it, it, it had... Uh, there were two significant effects of the modernist uh, crisis on the American church. The first one was that uh, the clergy, those who were about to be ordained to the priesthood, were expected to, um, uh, to, to sign an oath against modernism, to sign an oath opposing modernism. And that oath continued well into the 50s, 60s, maybe even into the 1970s. I'm not sure when the oath against modernism was finally dropped. Secondly, the modernist threat, which as I said was a perceived threat far more than an actual threat. Modernism had the effect of weakening theological thinking in the United States up until the uh, 1950s with the so-called New Theology of the 1950s and into the 1960s when the Second Vatican Council happened, there were truly no um, American theologians of, of any note. Their uh, intellectual life, their theological thinking was stifled by the, the perception that they might be uh, modernists. Okay, so that is the Americanist crisis has to do with the Catholic Church. Second thing, I want, the second major topic I want to address has to do with mainstream Protestantism in the late 19th century. We're now in the late 1800s. I've already talked about liberal Protestantism and I've talked about the social gospel. But the fact of the matter was that the vast majority of people were neither liberal Protestants nor social gospel people. And in fact, most mainstream Protestants in the late 19th century had never even heard of Darwin, had never heard of the historical critical method of biblical interpretation. And as a matter of fact, many mainstream Protestants weren't even aware of the condition of the working class in the cities. They weren't aware of the poverty that was, that was taking place in the cities. Remember, a lot of those folks in the cities were Catholics, and many Protestants had no dealings whatsoever with Catholics. Okay? So, if they weren't in touch with Darwinism and with um, the historical critical method and with the plight of the workers in the cities, what was their spiritual life? What was their Protestantism like? What was their religious life like. They, this is generalizing, but they were generally simple evangelical people. They continued the same traditions, Protestant traditions, as had been prevalent in America for almost 200 years. They believed in the conversion experience, they believed in the interior experience of, uh, of comfort in, in being saved. They believed in more emotional rather than rational expressions of their religious faith. Most of them were either, um, most of these mainstream people were either Methodist or Baptist. They were, generally speaking, part of the Reformed tradition that had begun in Switzerland. In other words, they were Calvinists. Um, they believed in the Puritan belief system. Notice here once again how prevalent and how deeply rooted Puritanism is in America. We're now in the late 19th century. It's still deeply rooted in the American psyche. They also believed in the revivalist tradition. Uh, their revivalism in, in America 
as I said in weeks two and three, or as I will say in, in weeks two or three, two and three, um, revivalism is an integral part of American Protestant religion. Revivals have, have been taking place, still take place, um, have been taking place since the 1700s. If you think about it for just one minute, if you look at the televangelist, if you look at um, a Joel Osteen today, um, what, what is he? What is his brand of Protestantism but an extension of the revival? It's in a large arena rather than in a tent. It's in the same place every Sunday rather than moving around the countryside. But what people like Joel Osteen and the televangelists and the megachurches and all those people do is simply an extension of what has been a part of American religious life since the 1700s. And these mainstream Protestants in the late 19th century were part of that revivalistic um, tradition. So, to repeat, they were simple people, they were evangelical people. Most of them were either Methodist or Baptist. They were part of the Reformed or Calvinist tradition of Switzerland. They were part of the Puritan uh, belief system. And they embraced the revivalist tradition or the tradition of revivals um, that had been part of American Protestantism ever since the 1700s. Okay. Being, being of the Reformed, Pur or well, uh, being of the Puritan, uh, part of the Puritan tradition, they believed, or they stressed rather, the importance of free will, or the place of free will over God's predestination. In other words, they were Arminianists. They were Arminians, okay? Um, they stress the importance of free will. In other words, human beings can uh, play a role in their own um, salvation. How? Through being industrious and hardworking. Um, by being abstemious, in other words, living a very simple, austere kind of life. Okay? By doing that, they believed they could show God that they were worthy of eternal life. They believed in the conversion experience. That's been a part of American Protestantism for a long, long time. And they uh, stressed or they acted out their uh, religiosity with expressions of emotion. Okay? More so than expressions of rationalism. Okay, now... Within mainstream Protestantism, three core beliefs um, were, were carried on into the late 19th century. There were three. First, they believed in scriptural inerrancy. Inerrancy. I-N-E-R-R-A-N-C-Y. What is inerrancy? Or I should say, what is scriptural inerrancy? Scriptural inerrancy is the belief that every word of the Bible is literally true. And that every part of the Bible, every Bible story is uh, factual. It's historically true. Okay, So they continue to believe in scriptural inerrancy. Second, they believed in the divinity of Christ. They believed that uh, Jesus was the divine Son of God, that Jesus was more than a man, that Jesus was God's um, representative on earth, and in fact was God on earth who came to save humanity from our sins. And third, they believed in the duty of conversion from sin to the moral life. And so, the most important question that a traditional Protestant at this time could ask to another traditional Protestant was the question, are you saved? That question still gets asked today. Think about it. And that question was asked uh, of traditional Protestants 
by traditional Protestants even a hundred years ago or more than a hundred years ago. Okay, so they believed in the inerrancy of the scriptures, they believed in the divinity of Christ, and they believed in the duty of conversion from sin to moral living. Okay, what else did they believe in? Those were their core beliefs. There were other ancillary or secondary beliefs uh, that they also embraced. One of those was they believed in democracy, and they believed in the rights of the common person. Okay, um, they embraced the democratic tradition that had been part of or that, that had been part of the American Revolution. But keep in mind, they embraced democracy as they understood it. Democracy for them meant that every white male should have uh, the right to vote. At this time, they still didn't accept the uh, opinion that women should have the right to vote, even though Af African Americans on paper had the right to vote, African American males anyway, on paper had the right to vote, in actuality they did not. So while they in principle believed in democracy, they didn't extend that belief to either uh, blacks or, uh, or women. Okay. Next secondary belief or ancillary belief, they believed, and this is traditional, they believed that the United States had a mission. And that mission was to extend its influence throughout the world. Remember, traditional Puritanism had believed for 300 years that America was like um, the, the Israelites of the Old Testament, that um, the Puritans had come from a, a life of slavery and had been delivered to the promised land of America, and that God had a special mission for the American people, and that that mission had um, come to mean that America should extend from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. That had been accomplished. America now did extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific, although, although there were still territories within um, the Far West that were not yet states. Arizona and New Mexico, for example, didn't become states until around 1912. Uh, and you know the other Idaho and Utah and Nevada and those states didn't become states till relatively late. Still, those territories were under the control of the United States. So now, uh, America had fulfilled its mission of extending itself from one ocean to the other. So now what? Now the belief in America's um, manifest destiny or divine destiny extended itself outside the boundaries of the United States. And these traditional Protestants came to believe that America's destiny meant that the American dream, the American ideal, should be extended out further into the world. They believed that the kingdom of God would become a reality, um, was uh, made manifest through America. I think that's if you'll if you'll now fast forward to 2012, you'll see in certain strains of Protestantism this belief still in place. Amazingly, that. America is the greatest hope for the world, that America is the greatest country in the world, that uh, America has a mission to spread the, um, the benefits of democracy to the whole world, that America has a duty to spread the benefits of capitalism to the whole world. That belief um, d didn't start yesterday. It was, it was present in the late 19th century. It was present even before then. Okay. Another um, aspect of traditional Protestantism in the late 19th century was a, I'll use the word stratification, of r religions, or let's say a, a kind of social and religious ladder, that as one achieved higher social status, 
one's denomination, a person's denomination, would change. So that when a, when a person was of, of, of the low, lower social strata in America, he or she would be a Baptist. When they achieved a little bit of success, when they moved up the social ladder a little, a little bit, they would um, leave their Baptist congregation and become Methodists. And then if they really succeeded, if they were the well-to-do people of their town, then they would become Presbyterians. You've probably heard about this social Protestantism. Well, this is taking place at this time. Okay, so to sum all of this up, and this is to quote uh, an author cited by Sidney Alstrom, an author by the name of Henry May, he said, quote, In 1876, Protestantism presented a massive, almost unbroken front in its defense of the status quo. What that means is that in the late 19th century, Protestantism and Protestants were comfortable with the way things were in America. They were comfortable with the uh, super wealthy um, being able to exploit the working class. They were comfortable with African Americans being subjugated economically and socially um, to, to, the, to, to whites in the South and even in the North. They were uh, comfortable with the imperialistic, the beginnings of the imperialistic um, uh, interests of the, of the United States, the interest in, in building an empire outside the United States. They were comfortable with, with all of that. Um, and, and, and as ideas like evolution and ideas like uh, the historical critical method of biblical interpretation um, reached them, they quite naturally resisted them. These people were conservative in their frame of mind. They were comfortable with the way life was. And they really had no interest in, in changing it. They liked life in America. Life in America was good to them, and they didn't want that ride to end. Another aspect of this um, period of time and of traditional Protestantism was um, that racism and nativism reared their ugly heads um, once again. We all know what racism is. Uh, you should by now know what nativism is. The belief that um, only a certain that only certain people, well, a feeling of animosity towards certain people, particularly in this case immigrants. And, and, and Catholics, okay, and to a certain extent Jews. Um, so um, racism and nativism were becoming um, were coming back into style, were, were, were becoming um, prevalent again in American society. This was happening at a time when more and more of the immigrants coming to the United States were from Southern and Eastern Europe. And these folks were not assimilating into the American mainstream. This ties in with the um, Americanist movement. Not all of the immigrants had any interest at all in becoming part of uh, the American mainstream of life. These folks were, were coming from Poland and what is now Czechoslovakia and Russia and Hungary, and Italy, and Sicily, and, and Greece, and, and those uh, countries. And first of all, they had, no, they had no interest, they didn't know the language, they had no interest in being part of the American mainstream, and as a result, they ghettoized themselves. They stuck together within their own small communities. If you drive around St. Louis, if you look around St. Louis, you can see remnants of this, this period of time. If you, um, it, I'll give you a for instance, if you drive over, you know, if, you're, if you're driving east on Highway 44 and you drive over that flyby, that overpass that ties you into I-55 right before you get downtown 
and before you get on the Papa Street Bridge, you can see, um, I believe it's 14 different Catholic churches. And that's within a very small area. You can see St. Vincent's Church, you can see St. Peter and Paul, you can see St. Francis de Sales, St. Wenceslaus, the Old Cathedral, St. Laborious, Holy Trinity, uh, um, St. Mary and Joseph, the Croatian Church, and, and, and many others. I'm just thinking of the ones that come to mind off the top of my head. These different churches, which were sometimes within blocks of each other, represented dif different ethnic communities. So there were German churches, Polish churches, Bohemian churches. Yes, I forgot St. John Nepomuk. That was the Bohemian church. And, and these folks pretty much stayed to themselves. They didn't congregate. The Bohemian Catholics didn't congregate with the Italian Catholics or the German Catholics. It just didn't happen. Okay, so this was going on. And, and, and mainstream Protestants, once they became aware of these immigrants living in, in, in ghettos in the major American cities, um, they didn't like it. They saw these folks as a threat. And remember, remember now, in Puritanism, there had been, since day one, a deep distrust of anything having to do with the Catholic Church. Now all of a sudden you have millions of new Americans coming into the country. Millions of new um, immigrants. And most of them are Catholic. And most of them are living in the cities. And most of them are bound, uh, binding together and uh, having nothing to do with anybody else. Okay, So they were perceived as a threat by uh, mainstream uh, Protestants. Another outgrowth of this um, immigration uh, of people to the cities was the, um, the production of, of, of literature, of, of writings and uh, uh, schools of thought that believed that the white European race was the superior race among all of humanity. And obviously, a uh, deeply um, bigoted uh, point of view. But there were writings that began to emerge that said that the Aryan race, if you will, that white Northern Europeans were the superior race of, of all of humanity, and that therefore they had the duty to try to both Christianize and civilize the rest of you know the, the the rest of the of the human race a truly arrogant position but it was real at that time more and more traditional protestants at this time and remember we're in the late 19th century came to believe over time that reconstruction had been a mistake that maybe or that well that the attempt to destroy the social and economic structure of the South after the Civil War um, had been a mistake. And that the Jim Crow system of segregation um, really wasn't such a bad thing. Um, that was not a, it, it, America was not at its best <laughs> in, the, in this period of time. Okay, so there's these theories of racial superiority. There's deep distrust of the uh, immigrants who are coming from Eastern and Southern Europe, and there is a belief that it's okay, it's okay to exploit and oppress um, uh, black people uh, in the United States. That somehow the, the Jim Crow system eh, really wasn't so bad. Another group that felt the wrath of, of mainstream Protestants were Native Americans. You're probably familiar from your history class with the fact that after the Civil War there was a series of small wars to try to drive Native Americans from their own homeland onto the reservation. And uh, it, it, it succeeded. In 1876 you had um, Custer and his last stand 
And that's just one little bitty example of all these many little wars that were fought against Native Americans. And the, and Native, and the, the life of Native Americans ever since that time has never ever been the same. And the uh, treatment of Native Americans in this country is one of our more um, shameful uh, chapters. So this is, this is taking place. We're now um, moving uh, Native Americans out of the, the way, out of the, 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 the lands where uh, farming can take place and grazing, the best grazing and all that type of things. And, and they, they were literally herded onto the reservations. Okay. Along with this belief in racial superiority, there was also a call uh, or a belief that the white man had the duty to uh, colonize the world of color, to colonize Africa and Asia uh, and, and, and the Pacific Islands. Um, why? In order to share with them both the benefits of Christianity and the benefits of uh, civilization. Um, this is what this is basically what imperialism is: the belief that um, the benefits of Christianity and the benefits of civilization should be shared with non-white people around the world. Okay. All right. Um, there was uh, in 1886 um, uh, an event in which a bomb exploded. Uh, in a group of Chicago police officers who were uh, trying to arrest, uh, trying to arrest a group of anarchists who were promoting the rights of workers, um, this was called the Haymarket Affair. It's fairly well known in American history, um, and the the Haymarket Affair, the Haymarket Riots, touched off a whole wave of nativism, a whole wave of of uh, anti-Catholic um, feeling. In, uh, among mainstream Protestants. Not only were um, people of color, well, are, are blacks, Native Americans, and, and Catholics feeling the wrath of the traditional Protestants, so were the Jews in America. And so anti-Semitism um, also became worse during this period of time. So, the only thing you should know is that anti-Semitism, even though it was present, was never as severe as the prejudice against Catholics, blacks, and Native Americans. And that's because, as you know from your study of Puritanism, that um, the Puritans and their successors always had uh, this, this feeling that America was somehow the new Israel. And so there was an affinity with Israel. And if you notice, conservative Protestants um, even today, continue to have a very strong affiliation with um, Israel. Though those who, for example, were the, some of the strongest and most outspoken proponents of a war against Iraq, uh, of taking action against Iran, and those types of things, um, are inheritors, truly, of this uh, Puritan belief in that, that America is the new Israel, and that therefore the first Israel needed to be um, defended. All right, so that's traditional Protestantism or mainstream Protestantism in the late 19th century. Okay, I know I presented a, a fairly negative view of uh, mainstream Protestantism, but this is pretty much uh, where it was. Just to sum it up, there was a belief that the status quo was good and that it should remain the way it was. And um, any threats to that by anything from the evolutionist to the historical critical uh, method of interpretation of scripture to the immigrants from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe to, the, to Native Americans to African Americans, any of those things were perceived to be a threat to the American way of life. Okay, next topic, um, the emergence, or I should say, the re-emergence of crusading Protestantism. Um, there were 
a number of these type of crusade movements, these moral crusades during the, the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and, and, and the causes that, the causes that they espoused were extremely diverse. Yet, all of them, no matter what the cause might have been, were all motivated by the same desire, the desire to reunite America, the desire to reunite the North and the South, to reunite the East, which was more urbanized, and the West, which was more um, rural, to reunite city and country, cities and countryside, to reunite liberals and fundamentalists, okay? And they were motivated by the need or the perception that Christianity um, was required, that their Christianity required of them to try to bring, bring healing to the nation, okay? So these folks were um, neither, they tended to be more of the liberal bent than of the fundamentalist bent, but they were... Um, they were in, in neither school necessarily. Okay, so what were some of the things that these folks crusaded about? Well, one of them was youth. There was a conviction that the youth of America was being led down the, the path of moral degradation, that they were going uh, away from their Christian roots. And so these crusaders formed organizations uh, like the Christian Endeavor Society to um, bring youth together, um, to, to get them to, to do things in common, to get them to, um, ex to worship together, to go on mission together, things like that. Youth was one of their, um, their, their focuses. And, and I should have mentioned there were six of these. Youth was the first one. The second one is called Sabbatarianism. Of course I'll spell that. It's S-A-B-B-A-T-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. Sabbatarianism. Sabbatarianism is the belief, as is stated in Scripture, that um, Sunday should be the day of rest and that there should be no work done on Sunday. Okay? Um, this crusade worked for a while but gradually, Sabbatarianism uh, lost its, its, uh, its, its moral force. And more and more people worked on Sundays. More and more activities took place on Sundays, like baseball games and other sporting events. And, and, but Sabbatarianism, um, in reality, really didn't end in this country until about the 1980s. There were still what were known as the Blue Laws, on the books, even into the 1980s, where um, certain stores couldn't be open um, on Sunday and alcohol could not be sold uh, on Sunday. That's within my own lifetime. And so, Sabbatarianism, while it, it lost steam, uh, eventually it, it, it's a, it was a, 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 an idea that, that lasted for a long time in America. The third focus of the Crusades was missionary work, both domestic missionary work, work in the United States, and foreign missionary work. The domestic missions were mostly uh, done in the western part of the country. The western part of the country was far less settled than the east was, and when I say the west, um, St. Louis, in the, in the latter half of the uh, 19th century, was considered part of the American West. A little aside, um, until 1957, St. Louis, the St. Louis Cardinals were the uh, westernmost uh, baseball team in the major leagues. It wasn't until the Dodgers and the Giants moved out to California in the late 1950s that uh, St. Louis ceased to be the westernmost um, team or westernmost city in the major leagues. Um, so the West, the American West, was far less settled. Kansas and Nebraska and Colorado and Wyoming and Montana and Idaho and so missionaries were sent. 
um, there was a crusade movement to send these missionaries to bring Christianity or to um, help Christianity to grow in these areas. Many of the folks in the small towns either ne never went to church or were rarely able to go to church because there was no one there to um, uh, foster uh, Christianity for them. And so the missionaries went out there to try to do that. At the same time, there was a movement to encourage foreign missionaries into places like uh, Hawaii, who wouldn't have wanted to go there, um, and, and eventually into, into other places. Okay, um, another focus of the Crusades were Native Americans. Once the Native Americans had been subdued by the late 1880s, early 1990s, there um, were movements whose motivation was quite a bit different. So there were some crusaders who said that the Native Americans needed to be assimilated into the mainstream of American life, who said that the Native Americans needed to be part of the broader American culture. But there were other missionaries, uh, I'm sorry, there were other crusaders who said that uh, the Native Americans needed to be isolated, that they were out on the reservations, they needed to stay there and just be separated from the mainstream of American life. But there was a third crusading movement, and sadly, these crusaders believed that the Native Americans needed to be annihilated that they, were, they, they couldn't be saved, they weren't fully human, um, and that therefore they should just be uh, wiped off the face of the earth. Another sad contradiction in the Christianity <laughs> of the times. Okay? So, that's the missionary uh, crusade. Or, or I, I take that back. That's the Native American crusade. The fifth one were home missions in the American cities. Um, the belief was that the poverty and the lack of education and the alienation of the immigrants uh, meant that, the, um, that evangelical Protestantism needed to um, uh, move into the cities, that it was somehow becoming estranged, that, that mainstream Protestantism was becoming um, uh, estranged from... The, from, from the major cities because of poverty, because of lack of education, and because of the isolation of the immigrants. And so um, these crusaders uh, started organizations like the YMCA and the YWCA, YWCA in order to reach out to uh, the urban poor. That's the fifth one. And the sixth and um, I think the most famous and I also think the most uh, long-lasting uh, even though it turned out to be a failure the long-lasting most, lo most long-lasting of these crusades was the temperance crusade temperance of course being the belief that um, that alcoholic beverages should neither be produced sold nor consumed. Um, prohibition, in effect. The best known organization that promoted temperance was the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. It was led by a woman named Frances, that's F-R-A-N-C-E-S, Frances Willard. The temperance movement finally succeeded in passing an amendment to the United States Con uh, Constitution that, uh, that led to prohibition, along with what was called the Volstead Act that led to prohibition, which took place in the 1920s. Now, as we know, prohibition didn't work, but prohibition was the final outcome of the crusading um, efforts of the temperance uh, fighters, the temperance crusaders. One of the ironies of the temperance movement is that it ended up empowering women and it uh, evolved or split off into um, 
the 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 movement for the to, for the advocacy of the rights of of women. Okay, um, so the temperance movement led to women's rights movements, and in particular, the movement for the right to have women get the vote. And probably not coincidentally, prohibition went into effect at about the same time as women received the right to vote in 1920. Okay, so more than any of the other crusades, the temperance movement, the temperance crusade, really had the effect of, uh, of uniting American Protestants, as, as uh, unlike any of these others. All righty. One last topic, and that's American imperialism and manifest destiny. Okay, I have talked a number of times about this notion that America had a predestined mission from God. That notion was as old as the original colonies. The Puritans gave that mission its spiritual dimension by linking it with uh, Israel's liberation and, and all this type of thing. And this idea became known, as we have talked about, as, uh, as manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. Uh, as I said earlier in this lecture, manifest destiny first had to do with the expansion of America from one end of the North American continent to the other, from the east to the west, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But once this was accomplished, um, America began to think in terms of an empire. And so it looked in a number of different directions. It looked to the Caribbean, uh, first and foremost Cuba. It looked to the Pacific, um, Hawaii and Samoa. And it looked toward Asia, in particular the Philippines. The U.S. looked to more than any others it looked to um, the, the Spanish colonies, which uh, were kind of ripe for the picking because the Spanish Empire was uh, crumbling. The Spanish had already given up uh, most, if not all, of their holdings in South America, and now their empire in the Caribbean and in the Pacific was beginning to fall apart as well. The um, the presidential election um, of 1896 was important because both candidates, uh, William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan, were American Protestants. I mean, they were the per they were the um, personification, the utter personification of American Protestantism. No two candidates for the presidency were ever as traditional Protestant as McKinley and Bryan. Now McKinley won and uh, by, by 1898 McKinley started what he called a little war with Spain, the Spanish-American War. Um, he, he went to war with Spain and the United States captured both Cuba and the Philippines. And this little war, the Spanish-American War, was framed in terms of uh, manifest destiny. And it was the doctrine of manifest destiny that gave the Spanish-American War its religious uh, justification. So I hope that you can see that throughout American history, um, historical movements, social movements, um, economic movements have typically been framed um, among other ways, in religious terms. And uh, the, eco the uh, economics, politics, imperialism, uh, social stratification, all of these things have looked to religion for justification or for, uh, to, to, to place them uh, in, in context. So that's where we stand uh, at the end of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this little lecture and I will be seeing you again uh, next week. Take care. Thanks a lot.